Okay, this is um, lecture 12, and I initially planned to teach uh, um, green group today, but then I realized that some of you are using permeable pavements as one of your design, and this is also very common design, or at least this is very common things to do in many places, because that doesn't change, takes any extra space than you already have. So that's why I um, thought I'll put it here today. And um, this is a, um, there are a couple of announcement, uh, no discussion this Friday from TA. Um, he's not here today, uh, not today, on Friday. So that's why he's here to cancel it. Also, we wanted to have a discussion session early next week for your uh, midterms. That's why also it was good for to postpone it to that day. So that you have uh, this weekend, you can try different homeworks and see the solution. And if you have question, you can ask. Um, quiz three will be out today um, after 8 p.m. Again, this is from lecture eight, nine, 10, 11. Everything that is not covered in last two quiz will be part of this quiz. Today class is neither um, required for your uh, uh, quiz or required for your midterm. So everything that we cover until last class is part of the midterms. Um, project introduction is due Friday. I'll, I have met a couple of um, um, pro uh, teams uh, to discuss about their introduction. You don't need to meet, uh, it's just uh, it's up to you. Uh, because whatever you submit will give you um, credits, um, but uh, only when you resubmit with uh, our uh, inputs. So you learn from the process of how to revise. Uh, just but do submit on Friday for each group. Email TA and me uh, together so that TA is going to read it and give comments and also I'll give read comments. Homework four is due, supposed to be due Friday. I, you know, last class I announced that with this time we are not very flexible for about uh, extending deadline. Um, but many of you have some other exams or things and they keep asking on Saturday. So I did change it to 11.59 on Saturday. Um, there'll be no more extension after that um, because I set it automatically to release the solution of homework four on Saturday midnight. Uh, once I release a solution, I don't grade your solution anymore. If you submit after that. Um, uh, check campus where uh, other places where we discussed about the homework. We'll also discuss um, the last question, question time today, so that you, you have some more practice. Again, um, midterms will be on um, uh, fifth uh, on Thursday next week. But next class, uh, which is Tuesday, will be midterm review. There we'll create a practice session for you. Uh, we'll release the question. Which you already have the question. Uh, we'll put more question on it uh, so that you can practice here. Uh, we can discuss among each other so that you learn a little bit more. And you can also ask questions on, on related to homeworks or any other. Um, project is due on uh, introduction is due uh, this Friday. And this is, again, um, um, this is where we start taking your project's report more seriously because uh, you will not have any homework from the now on. So the homework is this. Everything you do part of the project is kind of your homework. So we expect you to work more seriously on the, um, on the, on the projects now on as if it's your homework. And so, uh, there are things that I discussed with um, some of the group, but I want to give you some um, generic uh, um, formula. It's, we don't call it formula, but something guidance that will help you think of your introductions, how when you narrate it. So think of what you are doing right now. You are creating a uh, solutions or you're creating a conceptual design for a locations where you can treat storm water. So those designs in real world is basically how your company will come up with the solutions for certain problems. So you'll have a client and you will submit a proposal uh, saying that this is something we'll do it. Or, and then um, if the client likes it, then they'll uh, turn into a contract. And then you will say that, okay, exactly what you're gonna do. So think of that as your uh, project report right now. 
So that means you have to sell uh, your ideas to a government agency or any places who can implement that green infrastructures. So that means it has to be compelling. It has to have a reason. Uh, it has to give a adequate reason why this is important uh, to do the things that you are doing. Uh, if it is, let's say, literature review, you still have to do the same thing. You, your selling point is why we need to know and summarize the things that you are summarizing, why it is critical. So you should have at least par four paragraphs. Uh, I'll discuss a little bit more about it, but think of introduction like an inverted pyramid. Means the most generic information will be in the very beginning. So that will bring all the audience and put in the same page, which is the storm water here. And then you go narrow and narrow based on what specific thing you want to do as part of your um, report. Um, so this thing can change, you know, every example could be very different way, but this is how the general introductions are written. So as I said, there are four paragraphs. The four, paragraph number four is the easiest one, where you write what's the specific goal or objective of your report, which is already you have, you have decided. So write that one and write the scope or deliverable. So this is like more like a, um, for instance, your, your objective of one of the projects is to design green infrastructures in a school campus uh, to have certain benefit. And so the scope will be, you will explore the use of this, this, that, and all that. Uh, let's say, explore the use of solar panel for energy um, and, uh, and use that uh, some of the parking lot as a uh, renewable payments. And so you'll write basic overview of what you are planning to do. And what's the potential implications? That way, when somebody read that, they, they end the introduction thinking that, okay, if I read this report, this is what I think will get out of it. So that's kind of a punchline for you and the paragraph four. So that's very specific, as you see, reverse pyramid, that's already very close to what you're doing. And the beginning has to be as broad as possible. Because you are working on stormwater, your broad, broadest thing that you can discuss is stormwater issues in the location you are looking for. So for instance, you could say that stormwater has been um, used as a waste or not used, they are discharged into ocean and it pollute environment. Uh, but the other hand, if you capture stormwater, it can become a resource. Uh, so that's like a broad way of saying this is part of sustainability. And then you say that there are challenges, you know, why you should, and uh, you can't just really uh, design a treatment system or, uh, or a centralized system to capture stormwater because it's expensive and it's a non-point source. So that's why it's important to use green infrastructure, which is a solution for diffuse source because you can put different location, different things. <clears throat> so um, that will help you uh, achieve that uh, sustainability. Then the paragraph two will become more specific, you know, because let's say you are looking for green roof. You'll say green roof is one of the green infrastructures that's used because of this, this, this. And then you start focusing on how, what is green roof. Very brief idea so that when somebody read the introduction, they get some sense of it. Um, uh, so that's uh, like, as, as you see, it can go a little narrower. For instance, the people who are working on school, they can say that and school are you know, part of the communities, it helps all that things. And this has usually a lot of space that is become unused because you the students use only this very small portion of the school at a time uh, sitting in the classroom. But there are so many other spaces around the school for different activities, but it's not being used all the time. So that, could, that means you can turn that into a multi-purpose a space um, that could also improve educations, provide shade for students or uh, some activities areas. So you see that you can narrow that down a little bit more green infrastructure to your specific project. The very third one is more about a challenge, you know, because why somebody should invest money on this? So then you can say that, well, uh, you know, for instance, the school, you can say that um, finding space is always challenging because, you know, there are parking lot that's essential. Uh, so designing this system requires a system level of thinking. And then you start thinking of all those different um, that you wanted to address. Particularly, you want to highlight here the things that you are doing, right? So, and so um, those are the, like, you know, why those are important. 
And so this is for research paper, this is the research gap. For review paper, this is more of what need to be done and why it is important. Uh, so that when you write the objective, people know, okay, your objective is this because you already told in the last paragraph why it is important. Mm, so that's how the most the introductions are written. Anytime you write introductions. And when I read these introductions, I look for the story. And most importantly, also I look for citations. Because, you know, as I said, you will be looking for lots of research articles and report to justify statement. So if you just write your story without statement, you are just uh, saying things without any proof, right? So your introduction should have as many citations you can. Uh, for instance, you say that green infrastructure is useful for sustainability. If you search green infrastructure and sustainability, there will be many articles. You have to at least you know, read abstract and title of articles and think of if this is a citable articles. So you should cite as many um, references. Because if you submit a proposal, just writing your own story, then the, the client will say, are you making up uh, stories or this is something really true? Uh, so that means many statements has to be supported. Uh, it gives authenticity, it gives the, the, the credibility that you need uh, to submit that grant. So that's all for the introduction, which is due tomorrow. Again, I'll give you this comment. So I just told you right now so that you have some sense when you revise your introductions, uh, send it to me on Friday. Um, okay, so this is again, uh, some reference for you uh, that you can use to write any introductions for any classes. And today we are going to discuss about permeable payments. But before that, any question? I want to also show that um, in in on CCLE, uh, I have uploaded. Uh, if you see, there are many. Um, there is one uh, PDF is called Reading Lecture Twelve Permeable Payment ASC. So that uh, in everything that we cover today is from this guidance uh, from American Society of Chemical uh, not Chemical Civil Engineers. Uh, so everything that you see over here, everything we discuss here is part of this. So if you are looking to use uh, permeable payments for your um, class, then you can use this. Uh, this is something, basic materials that shows what you need. Okay. And there is not much math involved anymore. Everything math that require you already know. Uh, porosity, bulk density, Hydraulic conductivity is a few things that you need to know uh, to design these things. And then you can see um, there are a couple of PDFs that's written start with project. It means that you can use them uh, to design your projects. There are informations that will help you write your project. And most importantly, you see the manuals. There are many different types of manual. Uh, for each city, they have their own manual. The reason I put uh, deliberately city of Los Angeles is because I'm assuming that many of you are coming from UCLA, so you will look for a job nearby. So being familiar with their manual or design criteria is going to help you in your interview. So these are the things that's why I put it here. So look for those, for instance, hydrology manual by Los Angeles. This is where I know that somebody asked question, why 85 percentile? All that is written here, okay? Um, so again, um, these are going to help you in some point uh, in job if you want to do it, um, or this kind of job. But other than that, it can help you designing your projects. Another is Project LA Green Infrastructures. It's basically um, more about runoff and water supply through low impact development of green infrastructure. So it tell a little bit about different design, what you can do. So this is Green Street at Los Angeles downtown. It has a lot of good information that will help you think of that. Um, and the last one on project is more on, uh, as I said, every green infrastructure project can have multiple values. It's not just water treatment. It can be used for carbon, offsetting carbon emissions, it can be used for water cleanup. It can be used for communities. It can be used for many other products, right? So these are written here. 
So the real value of print, there are a lot of societal value. Uh, all those things are here. Uh, by reading this one, it's a very short report, will uh, help you think of how you can write your discussion in a different perspective. So these are all here. So all those four handouts that I provided here will help you write your report. Now that we are getting into the report mode, uh, I encourage you to read them or just skim through it so that you know what is out there. And if you need any other, let's say you are working on green group and we have not covered in the class, just send me an email. I'll upload those manual right away so that you can start using for your project. Um, so that's all for this one. Let me share the permeable payments. Um, professor? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about homework for question three. I was wondering if we'll cover that later in class today or are we only covering question five? Uh, so next, next week on Tuesday, we'll have a review for everything in this class. So any question from homework one, two, three, you can ask them. Um, but if it is homework four, which is due on Friday, you can ask on the second half of this class today. Okay, for sure. Thank you. Obviously, you can ask if nobody has other questions, you know, but preference is first homework four because that's due now. Um, yeah, no, I was, I, was ask, I was planning to ask about homework for question three. Oh, I see. I somehow I asked, thought about homework three. Okay. All right. Yeah, you can ask in the second half when we discuss. Okay. Thank you. All right. So permeable payments. You know, you all see payments. Payments are everywhere. You walk on it. Um, on the sidewalk is a payment. Roads are some kind of payments. A multi-purpose road where you walk, you drive. Uh, so these are designed for us to move around. Um, because you can't just walk on a tree or plants uh, radius. Right so we design these pavements. Uh, the way we design this pavement is we replace that natural surface or soil surface or the green space into a concrete space. And so that's when you make concrete, that's the design. Normally you have plants, okay, these are plants. But when you replace them with a concrete, you not only destroy that green space, but you also limit the infiltrations, okay? There is no infiltrations. Um, so that's why you have lots of runoff and that's the reason why we are designing green, green, um, green infrastructures. So people start thinking about why not create a pavement where we can walk. We can also have a water going through that. Uh, so that's how it rise to permeable pavement. It's not really a design that's unique in the sense. So basically they're making the pavement sponge so that things will go through the, or it will soak water into it. So this picture you can see, um, uh, that's, a, that's the design of a permeable pavement. If you watch in a YouTube video, the link is there. Basically if you pour water on a tap, uh, these things are just percolating through it. So what's the difference? The only difference between permeable pavements and regular pavements is the fact that it has more pores. Okay, and the way to make that is if you realize, you know, anytime you build any structure, you mix cement with some kind of um, the, the rock or stones. And that stone size will determine how much pore space in between. And for permeable payments, all you are doing is you are basically making those particle size so big that they will never close in between. There are always going to be some space in between. So that's the whole essential design of permeable payments. Uh, or porous concrete. So why it is useful? Because you know you can still have that function of a parking lot, walking space, but you have to still, you'll still allow the water to move down way. But the challenge is, you know, why not just replace that concrete and just do that, you know, nothing else will change. Well, um, if you just do that one, this will break because the moment you are making this big space in between, they are not structurally that strong. So that means it requires support from the bottom uh, for that whenever you are using it or walking on it or driving on it, it will not break because there is things underneath gives the right support. So that's why it's not just permeable pavement, the support system that goes underneath is are also part of the design. Uh, so we are going to learn that uh, now. 
So now this is just a simple, uh, the very basic permeable pavements. And you can see on the top surface, what you see over here, it is, it is the pavement, okay? Uh, these are bricks. And the reason why it is called permeable pavement is because the idea that water can go through that brick in, in between the bricks. So the way you place it, uh, so that the, there are gaps in between. And then whatever you feel over here, as you can see, there are like, there are less cement, just enough cement to bind them so that they don't move around. They're like a glue. Um, so the cement component is very small amount. So when you mix them together, it just, they are just wherever their contact point, they'll stick. Everything else, there is nothing to feel. So it's basically you're soaking a lots of these big uh, rocks in a glue, which will just cover enough on the surface for them to stick with each other, but they will not be enough to fill the entire gap. So that's what they did. So that's that's the reason things will just move through this. Now, as I said, so this is permeable pavements. The reason it become again, um, but they cannot, uh, one thing you wanted to do is that you, you have to have a support system so that they're not settled, they are not going to be compacted. So that's why you put this kind of big gravel as a support system. So it will create this flat layer, you know, you put the gravel, you dig the soil and put the gravel so that uh, that's more like a storage or the transition, not transition, it's more like a um, drainage layer in the bioinfiltration system that we learned last class. So this is basically a drainage layer. And also in addition to that, it gives support to the top surface so that it's not wobbly, will not uh, fall. And in between, as you can see, there is a transition layer here. So this is transition. And this is a more like a drainage layer. Um, as you can see, there, there is a pipe here. Usually those pipes has lot of, lots of hole uh, on the surface. So that's how the water goes inside it. Uh, and then you collect that water or you discharge into under drain. And then you have basically, this is the natural soil. Okay, so these are the components. So this transition layer, the reason for this transition layer is that any sediments that you get from the top, it's not get into the base layer because base layer is used for water collection and storage. So you need that pore space to be uh, completely empty. And as you see in the surface, this is brick. It doesn't mean that everywhere you will see that as a brick. Uh, so this is this is just a four different or six different kind. We just saw that here. So as you see here over here, these are impermeable, but the, these locations are the place where water will move. So there is this gap. Okay, so it gives more structural rigidity and there's just the space is enough. Um, then you have permeable asphalt. As I said, it's just the same asphalt. The only difference is you put the grain size so big and making some, um, um, then this is the surface. And then you have permeable concrete. They are very similar, um, just the you know, what materials you use, but they are designed very simple, similar way. The other one is the grid surface where you create the concrete grid, but in between you fill with the soil. Uh, so that way, you know, it gives the structural support so that the soil will not erode out, um, but it is good enough for a car to drive on it or to, for you to walk. And then there are also plastic reinforced grid. You know, this is basically made out of plastic with a hole in it. Uh, so you just very easy to install. And then also there are uh, plastic uh, grids uh, uh, with the grass so that you can grow the grass in the same time. Um, the only thing, the difference is that this grid helps you retain that soil. So as you see, there are many design. Um, then there are many guidelines. Um, the most important thing that you have to think of is the flow rate. Uh, the surface infiltration rate, it should, uh, the flow rate should be one to three inch per hour, which is pretty high, uh, pretty low actually. It's, uh, it can be much higher. Most of them are designed much higher in filtration rate. Um, in fact, if you see that, that permeable payments that I show you, uh, that has to 
if you pour water, it is just going very quickly. Those are like a much more higher than this, this flow rate. Um, again, there are different materials um, that you have to consider. All are uh, uh, basically, any, any of them is fine. You can see what is the rationale, what's the reason behind different design parameters. Uh, <clears throat> um, let's see what is the design base infiltration rate. Yes. So one of the other factor is that you cannot design your uh, impermeable pavement in a soil which is so low flow rate that all the water has to you know get stuck there and pond. So that bottom layer of the soil has to have some infiltrations, and that's the infiltration rate is given here. Uh, so mostly it's a loamy sand or sandy loam soil, um, so that you at least some of the water will get into ground. Otherwise, everything will flood. You will not have any infiltrations. Uh, if there is no infiltration into ground, you have to put a liner or you just uh, drain that water to something surrounding um, a storm drainage system. Again, a corm number, this is something related to how much runoff it will capture so that you can see all that. Um, again, these are all things you can consider for your um, uh, for your uh, um, design. So now let's see what's the fundamental processes. We know this one, I'm just going to give you a very basic understanding of what we cover. So first thing is it has to infiltrate lots of water. So that that is basically your permeable layer. And so the very first thing you do is like you said, or you, you see this is the flow rate that you have to use um, inch per hour. So this is the velocity, okay? So that velocity, how do you calculate? So that velocity is basically flow rate by area of permeable pavements. So this is flow rate. This is area of pavement. So this is velocity. Velocity or you can say flux. So this is L over T. This velocity is distance over time. Below. inch per hour, let's say that's the way. And flow rate, the way you calculate flow rate is based on Darcy's law, assuming saturation. So that will be Q, I, um, this area is the, let me write this one. This is small area is this, this is, this is catchment area, okay. This is the source, um, source of the storm water, where it is coming from, divided by small area. Oh, sorry, Q, CIA, Q equal to CIA, not QIA. Um, so this is, um, this is one way you can think of that. Uh, but if you think of another you know, velocity, how fast it's going to move, this is assumed that every water you receive is all going to be passed through it. Um, but you know if there may be cases. You know this is until the velocity is smaller than the capacity. So what's the capacity? How fast it can move? That's based on Darcy's law. So that's K, hydraulic conductivity of the filter media. Um, this is a head dH over d and g. Um, that's it. So velocity is this K i. This is hydraulic gradients. Hydraulic gradient that you will learn that. Usually, if it is completely saturated, it's equal to one. That means whatever the head is based on the water height. So if it is vertical and saturated, this equal to just the K. All it means that the velocity of uh, water is equal to hydraulic conductivity of that media. That's so something you already know the concept. Storage is basically in that layer, this layer, how much water you can store. So this is mostly storage layer. Why it is important? Because if you uh, it rains and then all the water goes there and stay there, then slowly, slowly it can percolate. Okay. So having that space, instead of having everything overland flow and go somewhere else, you just capture that underground. So that storage depends on porosity. So this porosity, porosity N is basically in a pore space, um, volume of pore divided by total volume of the 
the footprint of the entire um, space. So that's the uh, porosity, okay. All right, so um, just know that flow is a function of porosity. It means you know, if you have um, if you have high porosity, more pore space, water will move faster. If it is like a small space, uh, then there are more resistance, so the um, the velocity decreases. So flow rate or the velocity is directly proportional to the porosity. This is flow. Um, assuming this is completely, you know, obviously we're not talking about clay. You are talking about the more like a sandy or gravel layer soil. So if you have more por porous, it will just uh, make water move faster. So that's why see you can the porosity will change based on what the layer is. In if you see there are three location here. Um, there are different cores of materials you can add. Uh, so let's start with that. The very beginning, that's uh, easy to understand. Start with the soil, that's natural. So this is natural soil. It has some low capacity or some capacity to infiltrate. So that's the one is there. And then next is you want to collect all those treated storm water. So that's why you have a pipe. So this pipe is for uh, to convey storm water away from here. And the reason you see this hole, these holes, are there so that the water will get into that pipe because when you when all the water comes in here the pipe itself is not for us so that means you have to design make those holes surrounding it so when the water will rise here then everything will get into that okay so this is the water then it will get into that and so next thing is the you want the water to move as fast as possible into the pipe as well as have enough space to store so that's why you want to have this one, high K and high porosity, pore space, so that you can store. But now um, the porosity will change if there are a lot of sediments will deposit in it. So that's why you have a choker course. Uh, this, this, the whole reason behind this one is to protect that storage layer so that sediment will not fall into that storage layer and clog it. So this is basically to prevent clogging of storage layer. And then also it gives you the support or the kind of space to install the filter course. This is not, this is, this is a, this is to filter pollutant. But as you see, um, this is not a required case. You know, this is mostly optional a lot of times because a lot of the process uh, pollutant is not something you design. You don't design the permeable payments to remove pollutant. The reason is water moves so fast here that it doesn't have enough time. The container doesn't have enough time to interact with the materials. But if you have you know, some, some pollutants are very reactive to any surface, so then you can add this surface with some reactive material so that you can remove some pollutant at least. For instance, you can put some kind of antibacterial agents like silver uh, so that it can kill some of the bacteria or pathogens as it pass through. But just know that filter layer has is designed to remove pollutants but it's not necessarily a comp mandatory layer. And so now what's the porosity would be? So this one would be among all the layer, this one will be the lowest K because you want the water to move slowly there so that the pollutant can be removed and also lowest porosity. Lowest among all those doesn't mean that the low, very low. Then on the top of that, you want to have another choker course because that's where you want to install that um, pavement and you, don't, you want a flat surface. So this is more of a support layer for pavement. And also this, this is also used to, uh, to, to protect the filter layer, protect filter layer from clogging. So that means now all next is you see the pavement layer. And then water will move through here or whatever the reason decided, design. 
And for maintenance, you just have to remove any kind of DOS deposited here. So that's the design principle. So any payment, this is the required uh, different location. So in quiz, not this quiz, but in the following the last quiz, things will ask is let's say what's the porosity, which one is the highest porosity, which one is the lowest porosity, which layer should have the highest hydraulic conductivity, which one will be the lowest one. Uh, so you got to at least have that reason. So now we are going to discuss about design. Um, these are different designs that you can see examples. Um, this is a porous asphalt residential dam. So that means you now, even though it looked like a normal road, it does remove uh, water. For instance, here you can see parking lot. Uh, even though there are lots of water is coming, you know, it just doesn't feel like there is a big flow there. This is also another one, um, porous asphalt path in a, in park. So that even though you have some impervious surface, it's not completely hydraulically disconnected or will um, infiltrate. This is a parking lot. Again, um, bomb shelter, um, the one in, in UCLA campus, you can see some location has this permeable payment. And this is the regular commercial driving, but again, this is a, one thing to know that permeable payment do not have high support. Um, it's very uncommon to see them in a road like this, which has lots of car and vehicles running because it can easily destroy the pavement. But nowadays there are newer technology where you can design stronger system, which is porous. At the same time, it is also can support um, car. And then again, uh, from basketball um, field, you can see that they, they can be also permeable pavement. Um, so again, as I said, there are different goal. Um, you here, I show you different uh, reason for it. The first thing for your projects, what you have to decide is what kind of permeable permit you want, uh, whether there will be under drain or there will be no under drain. So let's say the first one. Um, the very first one, the difference, what you don't see here, is uh, two things. Um, number one, it doesn't have any filter layer. That means this is designed for water quantity. Your entire goal is to remove water from the surface and just get rid of it as quickly as possible from the surface. So this is more on water quantity or flood control. Flood control. Again, all design, all green infrastructures are flood control design. But this one doesn't have any water quality aspect of it because there is no filter layer no or limited water quality i will not say no the reason is there will be some particular suspended sediments can be removed limited water quality benefit and so that means no filter layer okay so i will say no filter layer and then you can see there is no pipe. In which case you don't want a pipe. It's if the real soil itself has high enough hydraulic conductivity, then you don't need that pipe. So basically if your soil is sandy soil, you don't need that pipe at all because it's just uh, you know, everything naturally can be soaked into the system. You will not have flooding. So that means this soil is high K. So that means no pipe. You don't need a pipe for that because your soil itself can get rid of that water. And the next one, if you see the only difference here is that there is an under drain. And this under drain is uh, sometimes you do uh, when, you, when your soil itself would not have enough capacity uh, to naturally recharge or if you want to harvest some of the storm water. So this is more of a this is ground water recharge. The top one, no direct harvest. You are not collecting that storm water. But here, this is first or water reuse okay 
or you are harvesting that storm water. Um, that's why you have the pipe, but you still don't uh, think of pollutants. Then the third one, the difference as you see, the one difference is there is a liner. The only reason you have a liner is because if you want to either collect all the storm water so that you have more need of collections, or you want to protect the groundwater, uh, because if you are you are worried that there will be contaminants in the surface and they will all pollute groundwater. So this one, you do two case for protection of groundwater from accident because if you have contaminant release. And number two, if you want to collect and we use all water. So those are decided here. So again, if the soil has high infiltration, you don't have to have a, this pipe. If you have soil has low infiltration, so these are all given. And so these are the factors you have to think about what side it is, uh, what's the slope, how if there is any contaminant nearby because you don't want that because if you have this is doesn't have much pollutant removal capacity. So you don't want to create this kind of system in a contaminated area because it's going to pollute groundwater. And then um, you have to look for what kind of soil it is. Uh, if it is high conductivity, then you design different ways, pipes are not piping. And also it depends on the whether the soil can actually have that capacity to have this high load on the surface because asphalt or these roads are all going to be heavy. So landslide can occur if the soil is not stable. So you have to think of all that. And then you have to, at the end, you have to think also about the maintenance. Um, so now, um, just as an example, as, as I told you before, you can have also the uh, under drain pipe raised, like your bioinfiltration system. There you raise it so that you can have more recharge. At the same time, you have denitrifications. Here, it doesn't really matter. Denitrification, there is no removal of pollutant. The only advantage of having a raised outlet here is that you have this storm water here. So this is extra, extra water that can stay longer. If it stays longer, that means most of that water is going to be always going to be, there is only one place to go for those water is, is, uh, is going to the ground. Because if once the water level goes below the outlet, it's the only way it's going to stay there and uh, percolate into the groundwater. So that means this is the design you can do if you want to have groundwater recharge. More groundwater recharge. And again, um, you do that any places where you don't have to worry about pollutant. That means the water itself is uh, in that place is pretty clean. Or your groundwater is not very near, so that means you are very deep. That means you are um, you are sure that the natural soil can degrade it as uh, by the time that water get, get into that groundwater. So these are the design summary. As I said, we discuss all that. Uh, you have, uh, this is just a line just to show that what's the size of it. Um, what kind of, uh, let's say this is a one to two inch um, thickness and all that things are given. Inch and centimeters and they give you the specification of the size of all that. Pore size or the particle size. Uh, so how you are going to design it? Again, uh, the design is simple thing. You start digging it. Uh, so this is this is what they saw here. Uh, the way to design it is you first dig the soil and then put the liner. This is the liner, that's how it looks like. And once you pull the liner, you start putting the, the concrete materials, whatever you want to pour on it. So this is the, the, the rock that goes into to support the layer. And then on top of that, you put the, put basically different layer. So you, you dig the soil, then you pour the storage layer and put the pipe then you put some kind of sand or something, other things as a choker layer. But again, it has some degree of glue so that it can stay as a sticky to each other. 
uh, so that it doesn't fall into the, the gravel. Then you have um, the top one will be for the support, asphalt. And a lot of times when you use these kind of techniques, uh, you got to really wash the stones because you don't want any kind of fine particles. So that's why you see the here, uh, it has to be washed, clean and washed and crossed to make it small enough. So there are big rocks and then you do that. The last thing uh, for your design or for your projects, if you use this one, you have to think of maintenance. And uh, this is why things are more important because cause the permeable payments designing cost is not as bad as maintenance cost. As you can see over here, they can easily get clogged. Uh, if things, uh, if you are driving on it or if it is here by any locations downstream, all the sediments that produce in the, ups, in the upstream is going to be all into uh, come to you the locations. So that's why you got to have a regulations that any construction is done on the up, upstream has to remove their own sediments they create. So you got to have that sedimentation control in their locations. Um, then another thing is that if you put, if your organic materials are deposited in the system like leaves and other things, and they can start growing, you know, the bacteria will grow and the clogging might occur for bioclogging. Uh, so all those factors you have to think. And uh, then it can be also, you know, as you see over here, this is a person uh, because of those holes are there and that could be a trip, trip hazard, um, particularly those kind of hills. Uh, so you got to make sure um, you have to fill those uh, with uh, some kind of stone so that people don't uh, fall because of that. Uh, so all those other aspects you have to think. Um, then time to time, there will be sediments clogging, as you can see here, um, those clogged, um, clogged layer. You got to clean those time to time. The way people clean it, either dry ice, uh, like this dry air, you, you use this high flow rate dry air so that you can blow all the things and or you can put water directly. Uh, so you can see there are different way how it is important to um, uh, use a specifically clean up that area. Um, these are the different maintenance way how it is done. Typically it's done once a year. Uh, sometimes it do two or three times for sweeping, but uh, the real heavy maintenance where you remove those fine particles is uh, once a year. And then many other things you guys may, may, may have to do based on the client requirement, but this is what's the, uh, again, all of these things are in your um, handout. So that's all uh, what you need to know for permeable payments. So now uh, we'll have some quiz question as a practice and then we'll have a break. I see some chart window, somewhere there is a thin permeable payments layer can be used on highway to reroute water to the sites rather than infiltrating it. Um, that was just something I came across. I thought it was relevant and interesting, so I thought I'd share. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was just trying to think uh, in what case they would do that. Um, I think the context of it was it was a big highway and the climate there, it was very rainy. Mm -hmm. And rather than um, like tilting the pavement and letting it kind of just yeah. pour down the sides, they decided to just pave the whole road with a thin layer and then just reroute the water instead of having it infiltrate down. And that okay. way they were able to get around the, the load capacity oh, restraint. Yeah, good, good. Thanks, Emma. All right, so let's have this, uh, you know, hopefully this is good enough for you to brainstorm now. Let's see what the answer would be. So I'm gonna launch the poll. Question is in a permeable pavement, if you raise the under drain outlet further close to ground, um, close to ground uh, um, to increase storage layer depth, uh, how would it affect the groundwater recharge, assuming there is no liner at the bottom? So I'm asking is, if you, uh, in the question here, if you, if this one become taller, okay, so how this groundwater recharge will happen? 
is this going to increase or decrease and all that. So you have already 30, 20 students have answered. You have 15 more seconds. So think of what will happen and then you can see if you raise it, there is one, something will change. This height will going to increase. The wall that strap here is going to increase more. It's going to increase more, what will happen to this one? Okay, I'm going to stop the in five seconds. You should you should answer whatever comes to your mind. Right? So I mean, it's not all right. So share the result. Uh, let's see. You know what's the wrong answers. That's the way you learn more. Um, first of all, if you if you increase the height, what will happen is your as I said, the flow rate will depends on the couple of things. This flow rate, if you see, remember, uh, um, that's his law. The flow rate is Q, K, I, which is dH over dG area. So K is hydraulic conductivity. That's not going to change whether you raise up or not. Area is also not going to change based on this. This is the area of the things. The only thing that change is this. What is going to happen is the height, h, the head above it is going to change. If the head above is going to change, then obviously you are you are having more water pushing through that soil. So that head difference is going to be much higher in certain time distance. So uh, so that's why it's going to push water much faster. It's like if you pour more water, there will be more water going into ground. So that means it's going to increase the groundwater recharge. So the right answer is B. Okay, so now let's try the next one. Permeable pavements can remove dissolved pollutants from storm water. Is it true or false? Uh, professor? Yeah. Can you explain the purpose of a liner again? So liner is going to, the liner is basically block any water going below it, right? So the cases where you do that is where you don't want any groundwater recharge. That means you are concerned that groundwater is going to be polluted by whatever water comes in. So that's the protection of groundwater is one reason. Number two, you don't want to lose any water to ground. You want to use, collect all of them to reuse. For instance, in school, if you want to collect that water for some use, then you want you don't want groundwater recharge. You want to use it right right there. Uh, so more stormwater harvesting. If you want to put a liner. Thank you. All right. So permeable pavements can remove dissolved pollutants from stormwater. All right. So we have another. 10 seconds, just think of where either, is there any location even in most common design, does it remove, what it removes? It removes basically sediments. It sediments is a dissolved pollutant. I'm going to end the poll now. So as you see that, you know, the only places where they can remove um, dissolved pollutant, if you have a filter layer, which is reactive, most of the time it's moving so fast and doesn't have filter layer. So traditionally it doesn't remove any dissolved pollutants. It's, it's just very little to nothing. So um, answer is false. It only removes sediments. Okay, polymer can remove particulate or sediments. All right, so uh, we launch. What are the two design features you would add to either increase contaminant removal or prevent groundwater contamination? So let's just, uh, let's answer. This is again, it's writing. You're not choosing something. So first one, any suggestion? Um, how do you increase contaminant removal? in this particular pictures? Um, if you were to put a 
filter media below the choker course? Yes. So the answer is A is add filter layer. That's the only way. Okay. Uh, what about um, prevent groundwater contaminations? Add a liner. Yes, so that's basically the answers that we just discussed. So, add liner. <clears throat> All right, so um, these are the discussion point we can uh, discuss at the, uh, I mean, I wrote it here. So this is just different scenario where uh, let's say what kind of permeable payments you want to design for wet climate. Uh, so you have to think what is in the wet climate that will affect the design, uh, what are the constraints. So we'll come back and discuss this. So uh, now that you have enough understanding of permeable payments, so first thing we'll do is when we come back, we'll discuss this different group. So I'll create two group. Uh, one group will, uh, this is a dry climate. Okay, so wet climate and then you have dry climate. And so that we'll discuss for first five, I'll give you five minutes or 10 minutes to discuss among yourself what could be answered. Then we re resume ourselves uh, to come back and share that with the class. And then uh, we'll solve homework uh, question number four, or not solve, we'll discuss the question because something, um, uh, if you have any concern, and then we'll answer any question related to homework. Okay, so right now it's five o'clock. We meet at 510. I see a chart window, art filter layer, yes. Okay. Okay, so for the group instruction, um, this is more like a uh, brainstorm moving for you guys. Uh, so what we'll do is I'll give a context. So imagine that you are designing green infrastructures in a location in Los Angeles and you, your company send you to New York and say that, okay, your, your client needs something there and you've got to go there. And so you go there and they say, okay, we are designing a green infrastructure here and we are doing um, permeable payment in these locations. So you say, okay, well, I did that in California. So now I'm gonna do this one here again. Um, so you read the manual, you say, okay, go ahead and do it. Um, there is a risk associated with that because anytime you look for design, you are looking for the storm event there, what kind of consequence it may have, what's the purpose. So I want you guys to think of those contexts, right? So uh, for wet climate, think of this is related to New York, okay? And the dry climate, think of California. So what, um, what we'll do is we'll have California, LA, New York, that's a New York City and LA, okay. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make two rooms. Um, stop there now, and I'm gonna make two room. Um, and then let's say two room, breakout room. Um, I, I created rooms and assign you guys automatically, or I should assign by manually or, all right, let's do this thing. You guys decide where to you can choose, okay. So let's see, rename room LA. Just because in UCLA doesn't mean that you should join LA only. Okay. You are going to New York. All right, so we have two rooms. I open the rooms. Um, you guys join it. Okay. And what will happen is I'll give you five minutes to discuss, five to seven minutes. And then I'll send a message one minute before that you, time is up. You guys should leave the room and come back and then we'll discuss what we learn, okay, if you design based on what you have done. And then I'll give you my input for that. Okay, so your time start now and start joining different rooms. Okay, now tell me which what do you guys learn from New York room? So what's your design? What you should consider? What are the constraint? Means uh, what do you have to think of when you design this? Well, I can go. 
no one else yeah. can go. Let's go. Um, <clears throat> we were talking about how compared to Los Angeles, New York is a relatively old city. Yeah. And uh, the way it's built is a little complex. There's a lot of um, underground activity in the city as opposed to Los Angeles, for example, the subways. Yes. Um, and we also mentioned or brought up the fact that there are there's a lot of waterways in New York. There's like East River, um, Hudson River, Gowanus Canal. Um, yeah. And basically the conclusion that we came to, I think, was, <clears throat> well, that was one. So the conclusion we came to from that was um, trying to do like a sub subsurface solution might be challenging just because there's so much infrastructure. So we yeah. kind of had the idea of doing a surface level infrastructure mm -hmm. solution that redirected water to green spaces mm -hmm. um, and especially around um, waterways uh, to prevent contaminated water from entering those, having green spaces on shorelines and whatnot. So you didn't have to like deal with any kind of permits or like any of the uh, logistics of, you know, drilling into the ground and messing with them. Um, consideration we had was it gets cold in New York and we were worried about like the water freezing within any kind of layer close to the surface that we had. So we thought that we'd make the top layer very permeable so that the water could sink down deeper so that there would be this kind of like insulative buffer so that it would sink down deep course. and then would wouldn't freeze okay yeah they are all very good points in fact the cold one i uh, didn't think about it before it's a very good point um any any anything to add or we let's have here from los angeles then we can start think of different design. LA, what's your constraint? Obviously, any of those things that they talk about in New York is not necessarily always there in Los Angeles. Uh, I can say a little. We talked about how since there's less rainfall, less flow through the system, okay. there's going to be uh, potentially a higher like uh, amount of contaminants. Okay. So the cool. issue would be uh, contaminating groundwater, which could be solved by either installing a liner in conjunction with the overflow pipe or more filter medias layers. Mm, okay. So, so your solution is because your it doesn't rain always. So every time it rains, it has it has to accumulate or remove or, or bring all those pollutants. That means you have to design something to account for those phosphorus high concentrated pollutants by having wider or wider um, filter layer. Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, another is the cost um, because if you think of uh, New York, the main reason why they want to have a um, for a uh, for um, uh, then uh, the permeable permit is not because water quantity, uh, water quantity because they have enough water. In fact, you know, climate change will bring them more water than they need. So their goal is not about harvesting. Okay, so that means you don't need that that capture system. You can just reroute it as quickly as possible. That's that's all they are looking for. They are looking for preventing preventing uh, combines sewer outflow, okay, CSO damage. Because that's their main concern. That's why they're designing it. Just reducing the amount of storm that get into their, uh, the pipe network that goes to wastewater. So this is the main reason for them, right? And so that means, you know, you got to design this one so that you can lower the peak flow, okay? so. Uh, so that means you know these systems are actually very popular in New York because of that reason, okay. And second, uh, your concern about the disrupting infrastructures because you have other things around like underground network, uh, you have to think of what's the size of these systems. They don't go deeper than one two feet, maximum one or two feet, okay. So that really 
you know, if you think of the gas line and any other things that you design, they are much deeper than that. So these systems do not disrupt the existing kind of uh, uh, pipelines because of reason. And to give you another perspective, when you design any road, you, you dig those soil the same level. In fact, roads are designed even much deeper uh, for stability. Uh, so that's why it, it would not have that much concern in terms of disrupting infrastructure. But uh, uh, polluting groundwater or other places is a concern. Uh, but here, if you put this kind of thing, there will be less overflow. If you have less overflow, there are less pollutions. So if you don't have this uh, permeable pavement, there will be more CSO, and that means this is going to be more pollution in your waterways. So you're putting these things is actually decrease pollution uh, in that context. But you, but you are, when you said that, it's a comparing not about no green infrastructure. You are saying that they have a different kind like bios well, which will be, which is also a fair point. Um, but New York is very congested, not, not many space for bios well. So it's what it is, you know. So 90% time people, that's why use permeable permits. Uh, and if it is groundwater concern, you already learn how to design it. Just put a liner. Okay, if you have, if you have a um, pollution, pollutants, just put a... Uh, but the main reason for uh, LA is uh, water harvesting because they they don't have enough water, it doesn't rain much. So that means you are investing this infrastructure without really getting any benefit or the cost of, cost of return is very, very um, low here. I mean, you don't you don't pay for what you're doing. You know? So that's why anytime it rains, you have to capture as much water as possible. So that's why in the school system over there, you got to have a line or two so that you can capture that water for harvesting. So you put, so this is more on capture and reuse. So this is the main reason for here. So for that, you also have to have a liner so that you don't lose much into ground. Okay. Um, and second other thing is um, filter layer. These are, you can add any places. Uh, it just add to more cost expense. Uh, so you have to think of that. Another thing you have to think of is in in a, when it rains a lot, it also carry lots of sediment. So that means those sediments will always going to clog the system very quickly over time. So that means if you have to uh, you have to maintain or you have to have a upstream sediment control, erosion control. So you you need erosion control here a lot. Control upstream to lower maintenance cost. What I'm doing here, cost. Okay, but if you have um, here in LA, it's a dry climate. So most of the deposition will be because of wind. Uh, so if you have a uh, less windy locations or you have location it doesn't create much dust in the wind then use I mean wind dust is not as much as uh, sediment that can be carried over by um, by the um, rainwater or storm water as quickly as possible but again some location is so windy that all the time dust is blowing so that's a different story um, for the freezing things you know you got to think of you know if water freeze, it is going to crack the surface. The structure has much more capacity because if it can carry the, the, the car above it, these structures are not going to crack under freeze if you put water. Uh, what will happen is it's going to just, it will expand through the crack, okay? The, the, because it, uh, it's a fracture, it's a porous layer. So it's going to, water will just expand. The ice will form within that fractures. Uh, because the pressure will be released from that. So you will not have that issues at all. All right, so I guess we got learned something. So now we have 10 minutes. Um, what we do is we, if you have question on this last homework, um, what I think uh, what we can do is first, 
let's uh, create a room where people can go to that room to discuss about this homework. Then I'll join that. People who live here, uh, join, stay here, they can ask any other questions. So, so that you can, you can find your friends to discuss about this homework in that room. So um, I'm going to create a new, uh, so I'm going to stop recording first. Um,